philosophical discourse. So cognition, which is which can be explained as the process of knowing and knowledge, is studied by many special sciences that explain its various aspects and problems like philosophy, sociology, pedagogy, psychology, and in its written aspect, it gets related with language, literature, and linguistics. And as Dr. Jyoti Raina has already pointed out, we have had a fantastic session on language, literature, and linguistics last week. Philosophy as a discipline is quintessentially related to the acts and concept of knowing and knowledge. The, and as is the most popular definition of philosophy, which is love for wisdom. Also, the nomenclatures of the research degrees ratify this perspective that philosophy is to be understood mainly as a cognitive enterprise. Writing is an exclusively human way of reflecting, speculating, or analyzing the perceptible facts, the unseen aspects of the universe, and the affective cognitive aspects in relation to interpersonal, social, cultural, religious, and political fields. Writing is an intimately connect, writing is also intimately connected with language and domain, as we all know. In the philosophical domain, cognition is discussed as a com complex process of perceiving the essence of objects, starting from the study of interrelation between them. Cognitive effort requires a comprehensive analysis of perception, reflection, contemplation, and judgment of the objects, interrelations between the objects, various phenomena, the nature and meaning of life and living, all in the context of the humans, the divine, the non-humans, probably the biosphere, or even the entire cosmos. The points about contemplation and reflection about all of these mentioned pointers get documented in the written discourse and philosophical domain through rationalization, conceptualization, and analysis that include speculation, imagination, reconstruction, and ideation. Cognition in relation to the written word in philosophy is a form of consciously creative, predictive, and transforming activity, which is oriented towards a shared understanding of the word and its meaning. In a way, it's like a cognitive empathy. I now introduce you to the speaker of the day, Professor Akar Singh Rathor. Professor Akar Singh Rathor is a philosopher whose work spans Indian political thought, the philosophy of jurisprudence, human rights, and Dalit feminist theory, among many others. He has taught at various universities, which include JNU, University of Delhi, University of Berlin, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Currently, he is a professor of philosophy, politics, and law at LUISS University in Rome, and a visiting professor at Jindal Global University. Professor Rathore has an enviable number of publications to his credit and has actually published over 50 journal papers. His, um, he has authored about 18 books and edited books ranging from political philosophy, law, religion, literature, sports, and even wine. Professor Rathore's books have been reviewed and featured in Stroll, a dot in, The Wire, Outlook, Caravan, EPW, The Hindu, The Indian Express, Telegraph, and numerous other popular print and online media. His book, Eagles India, published by Oxford University Press in 2017, was nominated for the Tata Literature Live Awards for the Book of the Year nonfiction category. His recent works include Ambedkar's Preamble, A Secret History of the Constitution of India, published by Penguin in 2020. He is also the editor of the five volume box set, oh, sorry, book set, B.R. Ambedkar, The Quest for Justice, going to be published by Oxford University Press in 2021. His earlier authored book in, uh, books include, one of them is A Philosophy of Autobiography, published by Rutledge. In 2018, in 2018, Indian Political Theory, as published by Rutledge in 2017, and one can find more about his publications on his website, www.akarsingrathor.com. 
he has been also an advisor to several policy makers think tanks educational and political bodies he has also delivered numerous talks lectures workshops and has conducted courses throughout india and abroad when he is not writing books or engaging academically with various institutions he participates in triathlons he is in fact india's number 3 ironman triathlon and has finished five grueling ironman triathlons well he exemplifies the wise man from plato's republic someone who combines erudite pursuits with sports or exercise regimes he has been fondly referred to as the ironman philosopher he is also an influencer on the social media with thousands of scholars researchers activists and sports enthusiasts following him keenly i now request professor professor akash singh rathore to present his much awaited deliberations and we'll have a brief q and a session after his uh, talk over to you professor akash singh rathore thank you so much rekha um am i audible you are audible all right uh, thanks for, so much for this invitation to speak from uh, the three organizers and my thanks to the principal uh, as well uh, very happy to to be uh, back at uh, gargi college i spoke uh, here about uh, i think it must have been 3 4 years back 4 years back right four you're years. right and welcome back yeah <laughs> thank you this time it's virtually but it's still uh, right uh, so today i'm going to speak uh, s- somewhat as a uh, as a writer uh, mm-hmm. in addition to as a uh, as a, a, a philosopher who partially specializes in um, uh, cognitive science uh, and i want to try to merge a few of these um, these uh, academic disciplines and and personal pursuits uh, and i hope i can express it in a way that uh, that will uh, connect with uh, with all of the audience of uh, different uh, levels different disciplines uh, different interests so yeah it, i just need i'll just interrupt you for a while professor rathor uh, can you switch on your video please we can't see oh, it it's not on no it's not on ah now yeah. you got it oh all right i'm sorry i thought it was on this all of this um so so when we talk about um philosophy cognition it seems that i'm only halfway on the screen <laughs> so let me try to straighten it up uh when we talk about uh, writing and we use this uh term cognitive we have to just pause for a second about why we use uh, cognitive shouldn't writing ordinarily be understood to be a cognitive process or cognitive activity don't you have to use uh, the mind isn't it uh, necessary to uh, to think through uh, the writing process but actually when you when you think about your own experiences of writing uh, which all of us as students and academicians have um, have engaged in uh i'm sure you, you when you reflect on it you think about the different ways that your uh, your mind uh moves back and forth between conscious awareness and um and floating off daydreaming uh staring off into space um falling half asleep and then uh also on the other side of it even if you're in the process of writing and not staring off into space or daydreaming even if you're in the process of writing it's not necessarily fully conscious in the way that you might uh, be when you're uh, speaking with somebody you get often into an into a mode which uh, which sometimes is called flow that it, you can call it many different things um where the the process seems to be uh operating in advance of your conscious uh, thought um and so there there just to to assume that writing is a cognitive activity is um can be a mistake there are also physical active uh, there's also physical side to writing um uh, a lot of people in fact uh message me um 
when I publish a new book or article or something like this, how is it that you just sit down and, and write? And I think the emphasis is on the sitting down because there's something um, uh, about this physical discipline uh, in the process of writing that uh, throws a lot of people off. So many people are imaginative, many people are creative, many people have wonderful uh, Shashi Tarur-like vocabularies. I'm not one of those. Um, and yet they're unable to, to just uh, have the discipline, self-discipline to sit in one space and, and take up the, the activity. Now, sitting down is not the only way to write. I want to tell you it's a very uh, uh, interesting story about a, a, a Norwegian writer who I like very much. His name is Torkel Brekka. He's, um, he's an Indologist, Buddhologist. And he writes a great deal of, uh, uh, of, of very accessible books on, um, on, uh, on classical Buddhism. And I, I once uh, um, was communicating with him about the most recent book that he had written. And I found the, the text, the, the prose, to be extremely dynamic. And normally, he's, he's always uh, readable, but it, it, this, this particular book, which was called Fundamentalism, was, uh, was so dynamic, the sentences were a bit shorter, more crisp. The prose was very, um, it just pushed the reader forward. And I asked him what, what was different about this book. There must be something, what circumstances uh, had changed in his life to make the prose of this, of his most recent book, which was the fifth book of his that I had read, uh, so different. And he emailed me back, uh, attaching a photo of a treadmill. And, uh, and the treadmill, he had attached a sort of wooden structure to it to make a desk. And he told me that he had begun writing now he put his computer system his laptop onto the desk across the top of the treadmill and he began he had begun writing now uh as he walked because he realized that we when we sit down to write we write for four six eight ten twelve hours a day and all of that time being sedentary uh, uh, uh has a lot of harmful effects it has harmful physical effects it also has harmful effects upon the writing it makes the writing more stale staid um, and uh, less lively. And the interesting thing was that, that it was so noticeable, uh, the fact that just from reading his book, I knew some, he had done something different. So that the, the process that he had introduced, the change that he had introduced into his physical uh, um, uh, orientation towards writing came out in the prose itself, available to, to a random reader, uh, thousands of, uh, of miles away from, from the author. So there are definitely physical aspects uh, to the process of writing. And I had mentioned flow. You, you, you can also think about, uh, for those of you who are students of philosophy, the, the great uh, philosopher Plato, uh, who is in fact whom I had spoken about last time I was at Gargi College four years back, he wrote a dialogue uh, called The Ion. And this, this dialogue is extremely uh, interesting because it's an, uh, a, a talk with a, um, we can just call him a poet, uh, a bard, a rhapsode, an epic poet. Uh, and the discussion with the poet is uh, Socrates seeking to learn from Ion how it is that he manages to write such exceptionally beautiful uh, poetry. And the funny thing about the dialogue is that Ion cannot explain it. He has, he has no, no way to explain how he writes so well. He can't explain the mechanics of it. He can't explain technique. He can't explain um, any of the elements of, of, uh, of uh, uh, effective writing, anything of the sort. And what it comes down to by the end of the dialogue is that the writing of, of, uh, of Ion, of, of, of a great poet, is uh, just a mystical experience. And it's something that we refer to as automatic writing, or although automatic writing assumes that there's a, a spirit or a ghost who, who, who is behind the writing, but still a uh, mystical experience can include something like that. In other words, in the process of writing, even writing something flawless, beautiful, perfect, it's often the case that this is not necessarily 
something that an author can capture as a cognitive uh, experience. It can also be a mystical experience. It can be a physical experience and, and so on. Now, the easiest juxtaposition between the cognitive is, of course, the affective. And last week, the, um, the keynote speaker had, had brought this up, uh, I think, uh, very um, uh, significantly. And uh, the way there's a, a kind of distinction between uh, cognition and affectation, or a thinking process and an emotive, emotional feeling process. And a lot of the, um, the struggle in uh, effective writing is a struggle between um, balancing cognition and, 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 um, and emotion. But I wanted to point out that there are many more elements than this polarity, the mystical and the physiological and so on. When we think about uh, this distinction between writing as a cognitive process and writing as an affective uh, or emotive uh, process, um, uh, I think, again, we need to be careful because uh, this distinction replicates or repeats a very classical problem, a classical problem that we all face, not only dualisms in general, you know, think, thinking through different poles like good and bad or male and female or, or what have you. Um, so not only that basic problem of dualistic thinking, but um, a little deeper, the problem that, uh, that uh, acts of cognition are um, necessarily entail uh, affective or emotive aspects and, and, and affectivity or emotional uh, experiences uh, themselves entail uh, cognitive processes. So it's not so much uh, dualism but we're not entirely sure how they fit together, how one takes center stage or focus and how the other recedes and, and what the impact is. And what I want to talk about uh, for the next about 20, 25 minutes is, um, is this uh, relationship in a way that uh, highlights why it is, or one way of thinking about why writing is so uh, important to an experience of properly merging these two poles, the cognitive and the affective, in, into a single process. So just to repeat, we normally think about these as, as a polarity, the cognitive versus the affective, but they're in some way interrelated. And what I want to talk about is the process of writing as a mechanism to integrate the cognitive and the affective in a way that um, uh, that is, uh, I think, profoundly significant for human social interaction. Okay. Now, I think the keynote speaker spoke uh, about, uh, last week, uh, spoke about writing in relationship to um, uh, self-knowledge and then also about uh, knowledge of the external world, and that includes knowledge of the other. And this is, um, in some uh, in some part, what I want to build off of. So moving, uh, accepting all of these ideas and moving forward with them. Now, when we talk about things as being cognitive, we enter into a domain in philosophy uh, that is, um, uh, or a discipline that's called cognitive science. And cognitive science is a sort of uh, scientific study of the, um, of the processes of uh, thinking, of rationality, of uh, of uh, the norms or canons of, of, of logic and reasoning, uh, probability, uh, game theory, decision theory, things like this. But it also entails the aspects uh, beyond that, that, that lie beyond the, the, the normal modes of logical thinking. So um, one can say that one reasons rationally by following certain protocols of, of logic, like um, like the basic form of the modus ponens syllogism or something like that. If S, then P, you assert S, therefore P. So any, any, any concepts you put into those letters, S and P, will give you an outcome that is a valid um, uh, argument, rational argument. And yet, 
uh, what cognitive science has shown, especially since the, the, the late 1960s, um, with very little hesitation, very little doubt, is that the majority of what we refer to as thinking is not rational, not rational by the standards that I had just mentioned, that they follow the protocols of logic or probability and so on. So what is the way that most of us think most of the time? This is referred to in various ways, but one of the ways that it was early on referred to as heuristics and biases. And by heuristics, it means that being incapable, have, failing to have the cognitive command of the rules of and the principles of logic, like the syllogism that I just mentioned, being incapable of calculating according to the uh, necessities of probability, having a, a, a lack of cognitive capacity suggests, therefore, or requires, therefore, that in the process of solving a problem or thinking through an argument or something, rather than using these principles of rationality, we just employ various sorts of pragmatic shortcuts. So um, you can think of it as, uh, as rounding in mathematics. So if one of us had to multiply uh, 4 into uh, 23, uh, we might find ourselves incapable of doing that and just say, well, let's just do four into 25. That's an easy 100. The problem is that unless we're working with uh, round figures and so on, if we're, if we're dealing with logic, um, uh, rounding doesn't uh, help. It creates a heuristic environment where, for example, I, I don't fully understand what you're saying or I don't fully understand an argument. So I adapt it to the thing that makes it easier for me to follow, just like rounding. And then I assume that that's what the argument is. And on the basis of making that assumption, that rounding assumption, I have actually distorted whatever the argument, whatever the variable might be. And in that process of distortion, what I come to, what I'm following are not reasons, uh, I'm sorry, are not uh, principles of logic, but they're just heuristic uh, ways of getting to an answer that I can work with. Um, and then, in addition to heuristics, there are biases. And biases are, of course, uh, the way that most of us think uh, very, very frequently. Uh, so, uh, uh, let's say a speaker happens to be uh, 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 a male, and we're biased towards uh, we have we're we're uh, you know misogynistic, or we're we're frightened of females, or we have a preference for males, or whatever whatever our bias is. Uh, the source of our bias is, we might attribute more credibility to this speaker, not based on the content of what's coming out of his mouth, but just based on the bias. And so consequently, we are biased, and socially, we all know this is the case, we're biased towards our friends to, to, uh, to accept the argument of a friend versus, versus the argument of, a, of an enemy. And yet, both of these, um, these arguments are if you abstract them from the person they are coming from, are arguments that have a logical form, logical structure, maybe true or false, maybe invalid, maybe maybe full of their of prejudices and so on. So, what cognitive science has shown us, just to sum up this little part that I've introduced, what cognitive science has shown us since the late 60s, 1960s, is that while we normally assume that we think rationally. Um, and that's how we solve problems using reason, logic, uh, uh, probability, and judgment. What we actually do when we're being um, when we're being uh, closely observed uh, is what we're actually doing is exercising a bit of logic, uh, supplemented by huge amounts of heuristics, and um, and and grounded in a great deal of bias, uh, prejudice, and so on. And so. The, the classical idea that the human being is a rational uh, animal or, or, or a rational agent, um, this as being the essence of what a human person uh, is, is, um, is uh, deeply mistaken. If we assume by a rational agent this normative idea, this uh, standard idea, that what it means to be rational is to have a cognitive command of logic um, probability, uh, decision, theoretical ideas, and, and so on. So then we're left with two options here. One is to assume that the person is not necessarily rational, 
The other is to assume that we've got something wrong with this basic definition of what it means to be rational and how cognition works. And I think the latter option is far more uh, fruitful. And so I want to get into what is it that might be missing from, uh, from our classical definition of rationality that makes us appear to be essentially irrational agents. Now, if we put cognitive science aside, I've just introduced it in, in some aspects of it in a nutshell, we can move from out of examining the way that an individual agent thinks through things to an, a person within a social environment. And, in, and, and this social aspect is studied in other sort of uh, 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 um, or discipline that um, it's an interdisciplinary uh, discipline, but where, where philosophy also intersects. And we can call this um, uh, social neuroscience. And the idea in social neuroscience is to understand what's happening in various parts of the brain when you put an individual agent in a social environment. So if it's a cognitive scientific study, you might study uh, some subject in, an isol in isolation solving a problem. But if it's a social neuroscientific study, instead of studying a subject put in isolation solving a problem, you can put that subject into a social group, into a group, and see how, what, what alters, what changes in the way that a subject thinks when put in a social environment. And uh, social neuroscience has shown an amazing number of, of insights about the way that our cognitive processes get, on the one hand, uh, interfered with when we're put in a social environment, but on a more positive light, how they also can get enhanced. Now, I'm not going to speak about the enhancement in social environment, although you can just mention, for example, brainstorming. I'm sure your teachers have put you uh, in brainstorming sessions where you come into small groups and think through ideas, think through um, challenges or how to solve a problem or something like this. And the, the reason that you're put into a group to brainstorm rather than set uh, alone uh, to do so is precisely because of the synergistic, syner am I pronouncing that correctly, Synergy, synergistic, synergistic um, uh, features of, uh, of uh, uh, forming a small group in order to think through a uh, problem. Uh, so we know there are po certain positive aspects, but the largest share of the study of the individual within a uh, social group especially undertaken in social psychology, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the larger share uh, suggests various kinds of disruptions and interferences in, uh, in an in individual agent's cognitive processes when put into a social group. So there are two ways then, from the cognitive science point of view of thinking about whether um, a cognitive process is, um, is, uh, is even possible. If it is um, if it is a fiction, um, if we are uh, uh, we we can be rational at all according to the classical ideas of, of uh, what it means to be rational, and the social uh, circumstances when we're put into a social group, does it mess with our rational processes? Does it enhance or does it degrade them? And there are small cases of enhancement like brainstorming in groups, but the larger share are distortions, and these distortions are many and varied. You can look up any of the experiments in social psychology to get deeply depressed about uh, the way that we behave um, uh, when we're in groups, uh, herding, conforming, obedience to uh, authority, all, all kinds of, uh, of negative uh, experiments in this respect. I'm going to name one of them, just so I'm not speaking purely abstractly. Uh, it's a very early experiment, I believe, from 19 should have been the early 1960s. Um, it was an experiment so simple. Uh, a professor of uh, psychology simply held up a chart that had lines or bars of different heights, three of them. So just as my finger are, well, let's say different heights, um, uh, one, two, and three. Uh, and then one, one other bar was held up uh, beside it, and people were asked to say whether this one 
was more similar to the first, second, or third um, uh, bar in height. And while this is merely a perception study, and anyone who's, uh, who ha has not got impaired perception should be able to say, well, yes, this one is similar to this one. When you put people in groups, um, and if members of the group uh, suggest that this one is in fact similar to this one, the, this small, uh, you'll find, the, the studies find, that a huge number of people actually change their answer to conform to what this, um, what the group is saying. Now, there are a lot of variables, you know, if there's only one other person saying the wrong answer, then we're, we're less likely to conform to that one other person. If there are 30 other people saying the wrong answer, we're less likely to conform. But there's a sweet spot, which is around 15 people. And as soon as 15 people give a different answer from you, you're almost 100% likely to give the wrong answer. And why does that happen? What, what's going on in our brain in order to, to, um, to force us to, to, to change our perception? And the question, of course, has always been, is it that our perception is actually physiologically, neurologically changing? To in conformity of the group through this herd herding sort of instinct, or is it the case that we are uh, being deceptive and we're just articulating a sort of conformity so that we don't get ostracized from the group? So that's one example within um, the social setting how our cognitive processes somehow alter, drift from the truth, drift from classical idea of logic or rationality or um, um, uh, knowing knowledge. In order to to get um, to get altered by uh, disrupted by a social process. Okay, so now I've set up a number of little um, uh, stepping stones for us to go through and think about uh, one basic uh, problem. And uh, now I've forgotten what what time I started, but I'll try to wrap up quickly. I know we're going to have plenty of question and answer. Um, one sort of uh, problem I'm going to, to frame now, keeping these things that I had said in mind. And that problem, probably many of you, of you, you have heard about it or, or, or know it. And this problem derives uh, from, uh, from a historical uh, phenomenon that, you know, all of us are too young to, to, to know too much about uh, personally. Um, it is the, uh, the, the Holocaust or, or the uh, extermination of, of the Jews, the Jewish people in the Second World War. Now, why I bring this up is because there was a very famous case, infamous case. Many, many people who, who, were, who were responsible for the extermination program, uh, the Holocaust in uh, Germany, were put on trial after the after the war, the trials uh, called the Nuremberg trials, but some people either escaped or were uh, uh, not subject to the trial for various reasons. And one of these people uh, was named Adolf Eichmann. And Adolf Eichmann had uh, fled to Argentina and was living under an assumed name. And the, uh, when the Israelis uh, found out later on, uh, a couple of 15 years later, where Eichmann was hiding or living incognito, they actually sent uh, the Mossad uh, Secret Service to go to Argentina to kidnap him um, and rendite him. So they, they sort of wrapped him up, stuck him on a chartered plane, flew him into Jerusalem, and then put him on trial for uh, genocide, murder, crimes against humanity. Now, Let's forget about all of the illegalities of going to another country, kidnapping a person, renditing him to, to, to a different country and putting them on trial and just focus on the, the trial itself. What happened at this trial was there was a, a very great, uh, brilliant young uh, 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 philosopher whose name was Hannah Arendt. And Hannah Arendt, uh, as brilliant as she was, was unable to find uh, an academic position um, in the United States. She was, she had fled uh, Germany during the war. She was Jewish, and uh, ended up in, in in New York City, helping to found this university called the New School, and so on. Moved to Chicago, and so on. But she could hardly find a fixed position. So she decided that she would go 
work for a newspaper and co cover the trial. And in the process of covering this trial and sending back newspaper reports, uh, a, a basically a book length study came out, which is called Eichmann in Jerusalem. And the book Eichmann in Jerusalem has a subtitle that's called The Banality of Evil. And the idea is that evil is understood not as being banal or everyday or uh, unassuming or uh, sort of um, how whatever synonyms you can think of for banal. I hope I gave uh, enough to work uh, if you don't know the word. Um, uh, evil is generally assumed to be monstrous, to be horrifying, to be to be uh, to be you know larger than life. And something banal is something, you know, just uh, smaller than life, something uh, almost insignificant, irrelevant. So this idea, this report on the banality of evil was an assumption, was a, I'm sorry, was an assertion that something as horrific and monstrous as playing a crucial part in the genocide of the Jewish people was not perpetrated by some horrific monster. It was perpetrated by a very simple, um, meek, uh, and, uh, and here's the, 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 the sort of rub, the sort of problem, uh, extremely intelligent uh, uh, person, Adolf Eichmann. Now, when we call Eichmann intelligent, the issue is to go back to where I had begun with what we refer to as the norms or the standard idea, standard picture of rationality, that you can use logic, you can use probability, you understand logistics uh, and how to make decisions that optimize results and all of these sort of classical um, economic, econometric, logistical, statistical, rational ways of, of thinking what it means to have a high IQ to be intelligent. Now, Adolf Eichmann's job was to, to, he was situated in Vienna, so sort of middle of Central Europe, and he, he was uh, responsible for getting all of the Jews that were found by the Nazis uh, in Italy, in, um, uh, in uh, southern France, uh, in, throughout the Balkans, and so on, and to get all of these people and, and bring them through on the European railway system through uh, different hubs so that they could be sent onward to the death camps, primarily Dachau and Auschwitz that are in, uh, in um, uh, Western Poland. So that means that you need a great deal of logistical capacity, how to think, how to optimize, you know, you have very few trains running, you have only two actually total of, of four destinations and you have um, a source pool of persons coming from uh, several uh, um, uh, different countries and regions and so on. So how do you get all of these people to their end result, which unfortunately is their death? Now, Eichmann did this uh, in, in a manner that was excellent. Uh, he was personally proud of it. Uh, Hitler was uh, remarked how that he was a genius uh, in doing this and so on. So Hannah Arendt, a philosopher, is now struck, is now, is now um, stuck in a problem. And that problem is that we have for ages, going all the way back to, to Socrates, we have thought that being good is in some way related to being rational, being intelligent. And what do we do about a, a, a person now who is on trial for crimes against humanity and genocide, whose intelligence is precisely what allowed him to be effective in committing this horrendous crime. So we have two issues here. One is that Eichmann isn't a monster. Eichmann is an ordinary, sort of humble, you know, uh, inconsistent, but very uh, logical uh, uh, thinking, rational agent. Um, he couldn't and he apparently didn't ever harm uh, physically a person uh, by himself. So he uses the powers of his, um, uh, cogn he uses his cognitive capacities in order to bring millions of people to their death. But if you put one single person in front of him, he would cower and flee. 
So this evil, this so-called monster was in fact not a monster at all. He was in some ways pathetic. On the other hand, the other problem is that he was exercising those cognitive capacities that all of your teachers, including myself, are always telling you to exercise and in some way referring to them as, as positive, linking them in the classical dualisms between good and bad. Obviously, intelligence is put on the side of good, just um, uh, in some ways linking it to, to the moral. And any of you who have read Plato's Republic uh, would also realize that, that truth and beauty and goodness are all put on, on this high level in the epistemological, this theory of knowledge of Plato's that links it to rationality and intelligence. So in other words, there's a correlation, a natural correlation between cognitive capacity and goodness. And yet what we find in Adolf Eichmann is that cognitive capacity is what maximizes evil. Now, um, I'm starting to speak uh, a bit fast because I, I have a couple of more aspects of this to go through and I don't want to take up the entire time. Um, so we're stuck now with a couple of problems that have uh, been articulated by Arendt in this book, Report on the Banality of Evil, and that have their source in the way that we normally think about things, normally think about reason and rationality, normally think about um, emotion uh, as, as, as being um, on a pole against uh, rationality. So we often in our dualisms, in our everyday dualisms and biases, we have dualisms like male and female, and these dualisms also trigger other biases like rational versus emotional. So uh, I don't know how this has become the case uh, in history because all of my personal experiences are the opposite, but people generally uh, uh, link maleness and rationality and femaleness and, and, and em emotiveness. Um, but uh, uh, these dualisms that we're working with are now being troubled by the picture of uh, Adolf Eichmann because we have um, someone operating, exercising cognitive capacity to, a, to an, a degree of excellence who is also using it for, for uh, it is the necessary condition for evil to, 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 to be optimized. So Arendt does two things. She tries to explore more deeply what is it that we think, what, what is it that we call thinking? What is really happening when we're, when we're thinking? So she introduces this idea, like I had mentioned to you, cognitive science explores. Cognitive science explores reason and rationality and thinking and thought processes and so on. But the difference is that within cognitive science, we get this normative or, or classical formulation which is very dry and free of the imaginative or affective or emotive components. And Arendt did something different. She assumed that maybe what's wrong with Eichmann is precisely that he embodies a very classical idea of instrumental rationality, using so the use of rationality to achieve goals. But in this case, the goal is to send the maximum number of people to their death. In other words, this goal is a crime against humanity. So there must be some other stages in the process of thinking that in some way alter the relationship between instrument, what we're, the means that we're using and the goal, the end that we seek um, to achieve. And in this sort of uh, attempt to understand the cognitive process or the rational process, Arendt noticed something about Eichmann. And what she noticed repeatedly, report after report, newspaper article after newspaper article, was that he had suffered essentially from uh, two problems. One, she said he had no imagination. And what she means by imagination, of course, we would have to discuss a lot more later. You can read the book. It's a wonderful book to read to get a sense of it. Um, but it's closely related then to what we will discuss. Uh, two, he seems to have no idea what it's like to be another person. So in other words, uh, Eichmann cannot transcend, he cannot use his intelligence, his intellectual capacities to transcend his subjectivity, being inside his own brain, inside his own skin, in order to understand what it might be like 
to be somebody else, to be in someone else's shoes, as we say, um, uh, casually. And this is linked to the fact that he has no imagination. Uh, uh, but, you know, we'll just keep these um, uh, uh, separate for the time being. When we, thought, when we talk about what it's like to be another person, once again, we can divide this up into an emotional and a cognitive component. So, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Leka had mentioned uh, cognitive empathy, and I'm going to discuss that just very, very briefly. So, we have um, an understanding of empathy that is more or less affective. So, uh, if I start crying, maybe you start crying, or if you start crying, maybe I start crying, and there's a kind of contagious aspect to this. Uh, expression of grief or emotional expressions, joy, um, and so on. And these, these, uh, this contagion uh, is generally assumed to be, um, to be uh, emotional, related to feelings and so on. Uh, but there is another kind of, uh, of, of understanding what another person is going through, and that can be done as a cognitive process. So let's take, for example, that... Um, that uh, uh, you're sitting in a room, uh, in a classroom, <laughs> so no social distancing in this experiment. Uh, you're sitting in a classroom with, uh, with another student, uh, and that other student has got uh, an apple, let's say. And uh, the student, uh, um, I'm sorry, let, 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 I have to make this uh, as brief as possible. So you sit, you, the teacher has given all of the students in your class an apple. You have an apple, other students have an apple. Um, some students have already left. Now, one student is there with you and she wants to get up and go to the washroom or something. So she leaves her apple, she goes to the washroom. As she's gone, another student comes in the class because that other student has forgotten her apple. She sees the apple on the desk, she picks it up and she walks out with the apple. Now, what I want to ask you is, do you blame that person for stealing the apple? If you had no cognitive empathy, if you did not understand what it's like to be in the thought process of the other student, you would necessarily blame her as a thief because you would say she walked in, she saw an apple, she grabbed it and she left. But since you, can, since you, you have uh, observed that the student whose apple it actually is, when she left, um, leaving this apple uh, 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 abandoned, the student who comes in is looking for her apple, which she forgot or has lost or something like that. You can cognitively, you can imagine what it's like to be, to have her limitations, her epistemological lim limitations. In other words, she doesn't know as much about this room as you know because you watch the owner of the apple uh, walk out. So you can limit what you know and think like her in her limited knowledge situation that this apple belongs to someone else. And therefore, you can understand that she's not a thief, a random thief of an apple. You can understand that she is thinking things through limited uh, knowledge. And so you, result, you absolve her of the guilt of theft. And you use cognitive empathy in order to execute that. Um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the verb for absolve, absolution, absolution of that uh, theft. So, in other words, empathy is not only an uh, when when you empathize with uh, someone, it's not only an affective and a, or emotional contagion. It can also be a cognitive process where you understand what it's like to be another person, limit your knowledge of a scenario in order to take up that person's uh, position and use that knowledge as a way of making decisions like judgments of whether guilt or innocence or something like this. Now, so that's a, a, a little, another little small building block about cognitive empathy. When Arendt accused Eichmann of having no imagination, she was partially accusing him of failing to have or exercise the capacity of cognitive empathy. That is, she was saying that it's impossible for him to understand what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And consequently, the theory of rationality, 
that uh, about IQ then gets supplemented with another aspect, which is this empathic aspect. Uh, and, and, and I suppose you can, people refer to this as EQ or emotional intelligence, um, supplemented with this affect, I'm sorry, this um, empathic uh, component in order to see what is missing from the classical standard model of what it means to be uh, rational. So part of being rational is not only having all of the talents and gifts that Eichmann indeed had, but part of what it means to be rational is to be reasonable. And what, it, what that means is part of exercising your rationality is exercising reasonability. It is rational to convict the student who came in of uh, theft for taking that apple because she indeed came and took property that doesn't belong to her and left. It's rational to accuse her, convict her of theft, but it is not reasonable to do so. It's reasonable to understand what her situation is, to transcend your subjective uh, situation and, um, and, and externalize into uh, her situation. And once you do that, you're not only rational, you're reasonable, or you have exercised um, cognitive empathy in order to get to get to more comprehensive um, uh, uh, understanding. That more comprehensive understanding has uh, um, got to be built into our basic definition of what it means to be a rational agent. In other words, being reasonable is part, essential part of being a rational agent. Now, with all of these things coming together, with what Eichmann has to say about I'm sorry, what Arendt has to say about Eichmann and his inabilities with the classical idea of rationality, with what happens to us when we get into groups, uh, our ability to, 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 to be um, purely rational being, um, uh, being undermined uh, in, in certain ways. We have to look at this from a, uh, a bit uh, wider perspective and see what is going on. And what is going on is essentially this exercise of externalization, this exercise of transcending the subjective into uh, the objective. So subjective is what has to do with me, let's say my personal subject, my personal uh, space, my person, and what is objective has to do with what is outside of uh, me. So um, uh, th uh, other facts, other uh, objects, other items, and indeed even other uh, persons. So the part of this, um, this idea of how we disentangle the, 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 the conundrum that Arendt uh, faced, that philosophers have been teaching us for millennia, that the good person is the rational person. Um, part of untangling this is to understand that what is implied by rational must be some com component of reasonable. And what is implied by, the, by this notion of reasonable is this ability to transcend the subject and think from another person's point of view or think from another uh, person's vantage point or from another person's experiences. And this is not a natural sentiment. It's not a natural capacity. This is something that has to be cultivated, exercised. And now finally we get to writing. So when we talk about writing, one of the first things that <laughs> that we mean by it is uh, a process of thinking externally. So it is still a subjective activity because I, let's say I'm the person who's doing the writing, subject, any one of us, you are the person who's doing the writing. It's still a subjective activity, but you're externalizing your thought processes um, uh, onto, uh, into making it objective. So it's no longer in your head, it's now out on paper. And that paper is now an object. So it stands over and against you, or it stands objectively in the real world as opposed to my subjective thoughts. So the activity of writing is, an extra, is a process of externalization. It's also, a pre, it's also a process of communication. And communication means you're once again transcending the subject, transcending subjectivity, because we're not just communicating with ourselves, we're communicating with uh, others. Um, and, uh, and then it becomes, uh, on a third point along these lines, uh, something which I hope you have experience of, and this is not just me, 
Um, but I personally never know what I know or don't know until I write. So there are many times, I hope this is not just an experience I alone have. There are many times I think when I was a student, for example, that I'm going to write a paper. And I'm going to write a paper, let's say, on the relationship of uh, truth and goodness, since I was talking a little bit about that earlier. And I have all of these ideas in my head. And I think I have everything ready. My whole argument is, is, is prepared, and this is going to be an exceptionally good paper. And then it comes time to write it. And when I write it, I realize I have no idea what needs to go in paragraph two and paragraph four. It just makes no sense at all. It was all perfect in my head, but when I get it out on paper, I don't know what's happening. And so this activity of writing, in my uh, experience, is, an, is a process that, that confronts us with the limitations of our own knowledge and understanding. Uh, you don't know what you don't know until you externalize it on in, through, through writing. When you externalize your arguments, your thought processes through writing, you then become objectively aware of your subjective lapses, the things that are uh, uh, problematic. So these are three ways where writing is engaged in this process of externalization. Um, and I had mentioned that I'm not going to talk about the imaginative part, but I assume you can in some way figure it, figure it out. If you've ever tried to write the dialogue, um, let's say you're writing a play or you're writing a short story or you're just trying to write what other people said. Um, uh, in my case, I'm terrible at writing dialogue. Every person who's speaking of any gender or nationality, whatever, sound exactly like me. So I've, I don't have this imaginative capacity, but uh, some of you, I'm sure, have this capacity to write dialogue as though it's really spoken by another person. And so this process of writing and the use of imagination is also something that demonstrates or exercises your capacity to think and be another person, speak like another person, represent the other person's point of view, and, and so on. But that's the, the imaginative component, which I'm just going to leave aside for, for the time being. Now, um, uh, the final thing is, uh, is just to more organically connect these things together. So what I began with is to talk about how we normally uh, uh, distinguish the cognitive from things like the affective or the emotive, as well as the mystical and the physical, physiological. And my argument has been that these things are far more organically related than we understand. And I gave some examples like an author who writes on a treadmill, there, thereby making his writing much more vibrant. I gave the example of, of flow or mystical writing where you're just off, um, uh, you don't, it's not a conscious process that you're engaged in, it's somehow an unconscious, subconscious uh, process, and yet the writing might be objectively precisely what you, what you, um, what you aimed for, or even better than what you aimed for, and uh, focus then on the distinction between the cognitive and the affective. Then I talked about cognitive science a little bit to suggest that there's a dead end in cognitive science with this idea that we're supposed to be perfectly rational agents, and that's our essence. Unless we redefine what it means to be rational, this is a dead end. Then I spoke about um, uh, social neuroscience and what happens in our brain when we're around other people and how normal, simple processes seem to get interfered with. And then I mentioned that um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, moving to a, def a, a different uh, uh, situation, in this book, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, Arendt starts to untangle some of these things by realizing that the way that uh, a person with an enormous IQ um, uh, was totally defective in EQ or emotional intelligence. And that nevertheless, this was not a process that was creating a dualism between intelligence and affectation. And what we find actually is what we need to supplement our classical idea about intelligence with is precisely this component of being with others, being um, uh, in the middle of situations with others uh, because of part of what it means to be rational is to be reasonable, and part of what it means to be reasonable is to be able to transcend our own um, uh, situations and see what 
uh, the viewpoints of, of others uh, is, the, the, the reasoning of others, the biases of others, and so on. Then I brought writing in, finally, to suggest that writing is precisely this activity, which, uh, because, uh, uh, let's say, empathy and cognitive empathy are not necessarily nat natural capacities. They have to be cultivated. So then I brought in writing as a, as a solution, as a tool for the cultivation of cognitive empathy. And writing does this as a tool by being a process of externalizing your thoughts, of showing you what you don't know. So you realize that, you know, this big head that we might have that we think uh, is, you know, knows everything is in fact extremely full of holes and uh, shortcuts and um, defects. And we need the information of others. Uh, we need the ideas of others, thoughts of others, arguments of others, and so on to supplement um, supplement what we uh, know. Writing is a communicative act, and in that respect, it helps, again, transcend the subject, and writing, therefore, is a, um, is an, a way to exercise our cognitive capacities to know what it's like to be another. And unless we know what it's like to be the other, we can never be uh, uh, fully ourselves, which is to say, that we can never have this sort of meeting of um, the, 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 the rational or the thinking with, um, with the good. Uh, and, uh, and I think, I'm sorry I went through it so quickly and probably leaving many things out. Uh, I think that wraps up what I was trying to, to say to you today. Thanks for your patience. I hope I didn't go far too long. Thank you so much for that elaborate, extensive, a uh, kind of conceptualization about what is cognition and cognition not being as a concept, not being merely being rational, but also being reasonable and also being cognitive and also being effective and combining it with the act of writing, which can bring in the communication, the communication between the self and the other through a bit of cognitive empathy. It was very very refreshing to hear you as always so uh, the house is now open for the uh, q and a session uh, i'll start first with if, uh, if it's okay with you i'll start first with the question on the chat then we have a couple of students uh, who actually are very keen to ask you uh, certain questions and i'll ask them to identify themselves or i'll take their names and uh, they'll ask you then there are colleagues also, and in between, if somebody else wants to ask you questions. So if it's okay with you, can I just read out uh, the question from the chat first? Sure. All right, so this is from Garima Mani Tripathi, who's teaching at uh, Mata Sindri College. And her first question was that uh, being good is being rational, but how far this argument can be related to the voting behaviors of people on emotional or religious issues rather than other relevant issues. This was our first question. And then second question, which is, how are we going to in, uh, inculcate the kind of reasonability in totality by which one can transcend the subjectivity, which could be applied in common sensibilities in most of us? So two questions. One is on being good, being rational, uh, and how does it affect voting behaviors? And second one is, how are we going to include the kind of reasonability in totality? so that one can transcend the subjectivity uh, to apply okay. to common sensibility. And both questions are from? Uh, Garima. Garima, yeah, right. Okay. Um, so I can see that Garima is a specialist in this because these are very precise questions. Um, so let's talk uh, uh, one by one. First, there are two different ways to think about a uh, vote. And uh, the, the ways that we think about voting in the, this respect in these two different ways is related to the two different ways we can think about uh, rationality. So one way is uh, there are, let me see, 146 of us in this, um, in this uh, uh, webinar right now. Let, uh, that's an even number. So let's say, um, Dr. Rekha, you get the deciding vote because you are the chairperson. Um, so uh, we have 145, and then you make a, 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 you make a final decision. Um, 
let's say I decide, I, I ask us to discuss, uh, I'm sorry, to decide the question of uh, how uh, uh, we decide the question, the second question of Gariman about how to inculcate this reasonability. So I'm going to give everybody two choices. And then if you agree with choice A, you will opt for that. And if you agree with choice B, you will opt for that. And so our answer would be derived by quantifying uh, the votes. So if more than, let's say if 80 people went for option A, then option A is our answer to how we do the uh, uh, what was asked in question B. Now, this is one way of doing it, which is, it, which is a tabulation or concatenation of, um, uh, of quantities. Each individual, one vote. Now, let's think across a completely different way of doing it. What if Garma asks her question to all 146 of us, and we spend the next 30 minutes arguing, debating, discussing, and at the end of that, we, have a, we come to a consensus. So what do we think we are going to do now? Now, in the first example of tabulation of individuals, what we're doing is that we're assuming that our thought press processes are uh, entire, they're uh, coherent, and that they are um, uh, uh, um, our own. They're, you know, they're autonomous. Uh, but in the second one, we know very well that I, uh, for example, I see the name uh, Almira in this uh, webinar. I know very well that in the process of arguing and discussing how to answer question two, Almira might give me an idea. And what does it mean when you give someone an idea? It means that in my own cognitive syllogistic capacity, premise two of my syllogism might be Almira's premise. In other words, it's my syllogism, if S, then P, but maybe P was given to me from Almira. So whose conclusion is it? The conclusion to the syllabus, uh, syllogism is a shared conclusion, is a shared rational process. And so many votes are done through this consensus method as, of, as opposed to this individual tabulation method. And so there are two different ways of thinking about how to vote or how to decide something. One is on this autonomous individualist model where every part of the argument belongs to me and I assert that into the objective space and then you arbitrate and we decide what's the answer. The second way, which is far more philosophical because it's dialogical, is the consensus model where we recognize that the thoughts that I have are not fully autonomous. They are influenced, they are, they are adjusted by uh, insights that you get from me and I get from you. And so when we come then to the vote at the end, it is not that I say what I think uh, and that's it. It is that I represent a sort of collective uh, decision-making process. And, um, and so, when I, so I, want, I want you to think about that when we think about uh, voting behavior, because uh, while uh, in politics, voting behavior is normally one person, one vote. In, uh, in administration, in, um, in, in um, various other decision-making bodies that we belong to, it is not, uh, that's not the principle we follow. What, the principle we follow is the dialogical consensus model on a faculty, during a faculty meeting, something like that. That's why we have the argument and the debate, because we persuade and, and so on. Now, elements of power, of course, come in and all sorts of externalities, but the basic, let's say, the pure distinction to be made is that what we want to achieve, ideally, is this dialogical model, because the dialogical model is a form of self-transcendence that seeks the end, the truth, you know, the result. I want to make the right decision, that seeks that through a process of engaging with, with others to understand their experiences, to understand how my own experience might be limited or false and, and so on. So um, the way that there's a, some sort of symmetry between the rational and the good is, of course, by introducing the dialogical in between. And that um, was uh, indeed Plato's argument in the first place. 
Um, now, how to inculcate this, uh, this, uh, this reasonable side? I think, you know, um, uh, <laughs> something happened yesterday. Yesterday was Sunday. Uh, I, I, I've started a new uh, column in the Deccan Herald that's called Purva Paksha, and I publish an article every uh, three weeks or so. And yesterday I published an article on, um, on uh, respect, uh, respect in processes of, of uh, argument. And, uh, and one of my former students, I think a new student, he wrote me a, 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 a message and he said, I wish I could write like you. Uh, and I was very much taken aback by that because I have all my life, even though I'm a, you know, a, a writer uh, more or less, I have always thought that I'm not a good writer. And uh, I'm not a good writer because my vocabulary is limited. I told you my imagination is limited. I don't know what it's like to, to write dialogue for other people. Um, uh, even my grammar, you know, all of these things, I'm just not, I don't have a great aptitude. So I was rather taken aback by it. And I was thinking about what it is, why he would say such a thing. And I began to realize that it wasn't so much that he was speaking about the quality, the, the technical quality of the writing. He was speaking about the, um, the significance, the suggestions, the meaning uh, behind it. And, um, and the, the basic argument was about, uh, as it is for the entire column. So, so Garima, please, um, so Garima, please read uh, these Deccan Herald uh, Purva Paksha uh, articles. I think you might enjoy them given your two questions. Um, the, the idea was that uh, during the constituent assembly debates, I was writing about constituent assembly debates. Uh, in the last speech that Dr. Bitker gave to the assembly, he first thanked, like any of us would, all of the people who supported him and, and so on. But he then did something very, very unusual. He singled out by name and thanked everyone who was constantly against him. And then, uh, of course, he gave the explanation why. And the answer he gave was, if it weren't for these people who were constantly challenging me, I never would have thought beyond the mere mechanics of trying to get this done to the principle I was fighting for. And it was only because of this opposition that I received from these people that I started to clarify my thoughts and my, what my principles are. And if it hadn't been for them, if I was surrounded by yes men, then I would just be an arrogant idiot in some respects, just self-righteous in my ignorance. And so this process was um, something that uh, I was articulating in, in the article that we need to understand that dissent improves us. Dissent betters us, uh, but it has to be done respectfully, of course. So I'm very happy to ask challenging questions and to receive challenging questions. Um, and I don't ask them by saying, you know, you're an idiot and you got X, Y, and Z wrong. Um, uh, you, if you ask them uh, with some sincerity, you are improving the nature of the conversation for everyone. So I think the way to inculcate this, uh, this reasonable um, uh, this reasonability, let's say, if you want to use the language of John Rawls, uh, reasonability, um, is to uh, is to demonstrate it. Demonstrate it as a as a professor, which I'm, I'm I'm sure all of you do. Demonstrate it as students with your fellow students when you disagree with them, and to 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 to, to, to demonstrate it with your ideological opponents that you don't just call them names, um, communist, uh, libtard you know, all of these words that we use, but try to actually engage, because if you are right, you ought to be able to convince uh, uh, someone that you're right. Um, now, that doesn't always work. Some people are completely entrenched, but slowly we pick away at, um, at, at this problem by, by demonstrating how to be reasonable yourself, and that uh, exemplifies for others how to be reasonable. And I am a strong believer in the power of, of the example. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there are uh, two more questions on the chat. So I would read them out before uh, I get on to the other questions. This is from Ridumina Kuti, and he says that this is an interesting talk. And the question is that some scholars 
of the embodiment school of thought belief that something physical and external like writing can aid our cognitive processing. Is that how one can correctly interpret your point that writing is an external activity that brings some amount of objectivity to our subjective thoughts? In the sense that through writing, we are able to refine our thoughts and refine our cognitive processing. Is it so? So normally I answer questions with a very long answer. And this one is nice because I just have to say yes. You got it exactly, <laughs> exactly what I was uh, trying to say. There are uh, numerous other elements that were left out of it. Um, yep. Uh, out of what I was saying, but essentially what we're talking about is a, is a interplay between what we call the subjective and the objective. So when um, I as a subject or you as a subject makes something subjective, objective, so take something that was in our minds and make it in the world, then it becomes something over and against us more than what we are in some way, just like uh, when parents have a child. Uh, that child comes completely from within uh, the uh, the parents and and yet becomes an objective thing that has its own life personality destiny and so on and this is why of course many people talk about their books as their babies you know they have a life of their own you don't interfere with what other people interpret um, your book or your poem as saying because it has an objective life of its own. So there are other aspects that I left out, but in short, yes, precisely how you phrased it in terms of embodiment and so on is it is what I was trying to say. Thanks for paying so much attention. And one more question, uh, which is writing is a, a powerful cognitive tool, and big ideas to require big words to communicate. But what happens when the language in terms of the vocabulary used and the sentences frame becomes the problem and obstructs comprehension of the reader. We as students come across texts which pose difficulty in terms of the way the articles are written. So how should we go about it? This is from a student called Alvia. Okay, thank you. Th th that question you've asked, very straightforward, very simple. But I have to tell you the answer is not at all simple and it's not at all straightforward. Because, because uh, you, you know, I was a student just like you. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, too many years ago to to remember, um, and I had the same thoughts that you had. Yeah, I'll read an article. Let's say when I was a philosophy student, I would pick up something by Jacques Derrida uh, or 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 Guy Tishkevac, and I could not understand uh, a word of it. Or or Maybe the greater problem is I could understand each individual word, but I couldn't understand how they fit together, what it, what it was trying to be saying. And, uh, and I became um, a bit cynical about this style of writing. Uh, I myself write as much as possible to be read by a first generation learner. This is a kind of, uh, let's say, ideological approach that I take. I want someone who doesn't come from a an extremely, uh, 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 a family of extremely educated people for generations. Uh, I want instead someone who's first generation learner to be able to understand what it is that I'm writing in this book. That's my approach. However, I used to blame and criticize people like Guy Tishbivik or Dehdi Dar or whatever for writing in this opaque, inscrutable way. But as you mature, you realize there are two issues here. One is, that you yourself evolve to be able to understand more, the more work you put in. And we can never underestimate how much work you need to put in. Just like an athlete, um, you can't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to run a marathon. Okay, and if you look at marathon runners, you think these people are crazy. You criticize them just like Derrida or Guy Tishkova. But when you realize that first you have to start running 1K, then 2K, then 5Ks, then 10Ks, then 20Ks, and after a year, you can run a marathon. Just the same, you have to put in that kind of physical work, physical and mental work, labor, in order to exercise enough to get advanced, 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 until you can read that kind of writing. 
So there's that angle to it. There's another angle, which is that we shouldn't be so um, totalitarian as to think that everything that is expressed in the world should be accessible to me. Uh, how many po poems just have the loftiest ideas that are totally impenetrable to a simple person like, like we may be? Um, but that doesn't mean that the poet should be hobbled and unable to, to, to make that articulation. So on the one hand, writing is not only for understanding, it is also an aesthetic experience. And as an aesthetic experience, we really don't have the right to demand that it is completely accessible to me. And that's just one thing to keep aside uh, uh, in the back of your mind. On the other hand, learning to read opaque writing, if you want to, 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 to know what it says, to know what it's saying, has, has to be, um, uh, has to be, is a skill that comes from exercise. You have to read every day, just like you have to write every day. I have always thought of myself as not very good writer, but one thing that I do is I write daily. I've always been a very bad runner. Just uh, in three weeks, I have the marathon in, um, to run here in Siem Reap. I'm in uh, Cambodia right now in Phnom Penh. So I'm running the Siem Reap marathon. So every day I know I have to run uh, 10 kilometers. I don't want to. I feel lazy. I feel tired. I feel bored. But if I want that result, I have to put in the work. If I want to be able to read something very difficult, I have to put in the work every day reading, every day writing. It doesn't just happen like that. And we have no, we have no right to obligate other people to write in a way that is completely accessible to me. So, uh, so, so I do want to tell you these things, although there are many other writers like myself who try to write for, uh, in the most simple and straightforward manner as possible. But we do it for our own reasons. It's not a, it's not a, a necessity we can command upon every author of the world. There are, uh, there's another student, Ekta. Ekta, if you're there, please ask the question to sir. Good afternoon, sir. This is Ekta Kumari from the Department of Philosophy. I wanted to ask you that how do we get rid of the biases which are deeply engraved on our minds via our social, cultural, political situations in order to be more uh, reasonable, rational in our philosophical writings, which evidently requires us to move beyond the empirical happenings and subjective point of view, which are prevalent around us? How do we achieve this perfect externalization and move towards the imaginative writing? writing for that matter. Uh, thanks, Ita, for that uh, question. Um, you know, on the, you, you ask me this question, of course, because I'm a sort of expert on this, but being an expert doesn't mean that I personally embody this capacity, right? Uh, it's something that I'm myself, just like you, on the path to try to achieve. Um, what I have... Uh, learned over time is uh, um, uh, a few things, a few tools. One of them is uh, that I purposefully immerse myself in among people whom I disagree with. Uh, that means, for example, on social media, I follow. So uh, I'm not advocating anything. I'm just telling you about my personality and my political ideals. I'm very, very left-wing person. Um, in fact, uh, an anarchist, uh, more or less politically. So what I do is, in order to not get completely wrapped up in a bubble of my own thoughts, my own ideas, ideas that appeal to me, I purposefully follow on things like social media or um, academic articles and so on, people from the right wing. And I do it because uh, I need to transcend my own uh, ego. I need to be given a dose of the outside, of the other, um, systematically and repeatedly uh, each day. It also helps me, of course, when I'm writing an article, let's say uh, uh, a combative article, it also helps me 
to ensure that I know precisely what my ideological opponent's arguments are. And this is called Purva Paksha. That's why the Tech and Herald monthly column that I write is called Purva Paksha. It's a, I write each week about how to engage compassionately with others. Um, uh, it's essentially called the art of compassionate debate. And so the idea of how you achieve this is again through exercising it. You can't have compassion if you're totally, uh, if, if, if you've totally um, dehumanized your ideological uh, opponent. And we dehumanize them when we don't recognize that they are very much like us. They were, they, they were brought up in different circumstances. So maybe that has altered their ideas, their parents are in some way or, or whatever it is. We're all more or less uh, the same in being inculcated, indoctrinated into certain ideas, paths, beliefs. So you have to recognize that. You're, you're not, um, uh, you and I are not special because we have this kind of ideological leaning. Everyone has, has such a leaning. And, um, and so you have to, to cultivate compassion by, um, uh, by, uh, by exercising this, um, this process of, of hearing, listening to the things that, that you don't like, that, that, that push you outside of your, your comfort, that make you uncomfortable. Um, in fact, uh, I said I always answer too long, so I'm going to close this reply with one thing that you may not know. I'm an extremely introverted person, and I hate speaking in public. It's the worst thing that I can imagine doing, getting up in front of people. And I do it almost every day, precisely because it's the only way to grow is to get outside of your comfort uh, zone. And, uh, and, and that's on a personal level for you know, speaking in public like this, or even in the effort to cultivate a more compassionate attitude towards, uh, towards others, becoming more reasonable. Um, just uh, be with them, uh, listen to them, argue with them, but with uh, with sincerity, so that's that's what I have to say. And to get that wasn't a very good answer. I'm sorry. To give a better to get a better reply, you can read these Deck and Herald uh, articles. I think they I do them very systematically, precisely on this topic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Can we ask some more questions? Yeah, there sure. are a lot of questions, but uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, one more quick question from another student from philosophy, that is Babhavi. Babhavi, if you are there, please identify yourself and ask the Professor Rajiv's question. And thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Babhavi Priya. I am from philosophy. Question is, uh, as with our bodily experience or physical environment has some kind of you know effect on our cognitive skills so my question is what is the real reason behind that what um, is it there any dualism between our mind and body or some interaction is or interaction is going behind that or the whole body is not physical body as such but the whole body with have some cognitive attribute is as a subject in that lived experience yeah well i, I think the answer is quite simple um, it's because I mean, assuming you accept uh, evolutionary biology, the answer is quite simple because of cognition is a later process, uh, evolutionary process to uh, this physical uh, uh, body. So it's not as though we, we were uh, um, disembodied minds that merged with a body. We were, uh, if you accept evolutionary biology, Cognition is a late evolutionary adaptation to being uh, a, a physical agent in a um, in an environment uh, that is uh, that is hostile and challenging. So when is it that these things became very uh, split, body and mind? This comes uh, uh, centuries, set, um, actually millennia, thousands of years after. Um, after the process of the of the evolution of uh, of human consciousness, so if you if you go back to the 10th century uh, BCE, you see that um, or or let's put it this way: there there are many 
there are many books written on this that are, are really very fascinating about how over time we have been able to see uh, different uh, colors. So if you if you look even at um, uh, uh, what era is this? About uh, uh, two two thousand years uh, BCE, you'll find that uh, the color blue was imperceptible to to most people, to most humans, um, and that this uh, uh, so in ancient Greek literature, in Homeric literature, uh, which was an oral tradition from from at least a thousand years BCE, you see that the sea, the ocean, uh, is referred to as red as opposed to uh, blue. And there's a book uh, called The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. I forget the author. I don't know how I remember such a lengthy title, um, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, which argues that, uh, so after the evolution of, of, um, of, co of cognition, there was, uh, a, a bi uh, the two uh, chambers of our brain were not, um, uh, they were, bi the bicameral brain was, um, was divided, not, not, not as they're unified now, so that when one would hear, uh, when one would talk, speak to oneself, one would hear it as a voice from outside. And the hypothesis is, this is the origin of like religious experiences, listening to gods, um, and uh, shamanism and things like that. So that we each had another uh, a voice inside of us that we didn't recognize as our own. And then this bicameral mind, this two-chamber brain, broke down and became one consciousness so that we then, be we did then had a subjective inner uh, dialogue. So anyway, if you go back very far in history, you see that there are a lot of reasons why we would claim this dualism between body and mind even though if you look at it from uh, evolutionary biological point of view, it is the mind that comes much later. When you look at it from a modernist philosoph philosophical point of view, we assume that it's the mind that is superior and controls all things, and it is the body that is just some useless meat appendage. Um, but I think that it's easy to understand this organic relationship between the physical and the mental if you just have a wider view that mind comes after body in, in evolutionary biology. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that answer. Uh, my uh, uh, colleague, Jyoti Ran, uh, has a couple of questions uh, of, from her and from her department. So I hand over the mic to Jyoti. Uh, some of the students and teachers of the elementary education department have a question. And before I ask the question that I want to ask, I request Dr. Monica Gupta. Monica, um, will you please unmute yourself and open your video and ask the question? Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Am I audible, please? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'm just, you know, I mean, um, it's, it's really been very interesting listening to this lecture, and I've been sort of flowing with it. And um, it's very interesting to see two kinds of movements, you know, which are sort of precursors to writing. Uh, one in which you sort of, you know, um, almost carry an affect within you for days. When an idea is incubated within you, it, you walk with it. You know, you eat with it till such time as it firms up and it's waiting to get out and to be on paper. And the other opposite, uh, you know, movement is when you actually bite in your mouth, you spill it. And in that stillness and calmness, uh, something manifests which you did not anticipate, which you haven't quite lived with. You know, and you sort of follow the idea rather than having embodied it. So what would you say about these two movements? Thank you, Monica. Uh, the audio was uh, coming in and out. Um, I think I understood the first part better than the second part. So I'll respond quickly to the first. Um, I know this is uh, when we talk from about writing and as a cognitive 
uh, uh, process uh, within field of elementary education and pedagogy and so on, it has a very different set of, it has a very different horizon from the philosophical and moral psychological part that I, uh, uh, that I was speaking about. Um, at the same time, uh, they have to be related at one level, uh, although uh, I'm not really qualified to, 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 to do that fusion. I will say as a writer and someone who's been practicing writing, I published my first book in 2005. And so now 15 years I've been writing very systematically. And what you brought up is 100% true, always my own experience, that, that, um, that one can sit and stare at the, 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 the blinking cursor on the blank screen. And it's a most horrifying uh, experience. <laughs> Um, uh, sometimes I will stop, I, I'll, 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 I'll stare at that, the cursor on the blank screen and it will put me off so much that I just don't write for two or three days. It, it scares me so much. But there's another opposite experience, which is that I might wake up or usually all of my ideas come in a steady state activity like uh, jogging or swimming. Um, or cycling, so not something like uh, something where you, the body is steadily moving for a period of time. Usually that's when I get all of my ideas. What book am I going to write next? What article am I going to write next? And so on. But what happens is that it builds up inside and then some catalyst, whatever that catalyst is, and it just erupts and it all, it all comes out. And this process is the opposite process of staring at the the blank page and trying to force yourself to say something. Um, so, uh, so I, I'm with you 100% that this is there. Now, the thing is to unify a little bit from this philosophical psychological aspect, why is it there? It's there because you've been having an inner dialogue uh, uh, in, in the past. And that dialogue, I believe, continues when you sleep. Um, when the brain or the mind sort starts to clarify or, or sift out things that are unnecessary, unrelated, uh, uh, and, and so on. And so this process of, of having an internal dialogue, rational dialogue when you're awake, like, should I write this or should I write that? Or what, does, what would this argument, how would this be better? Or how would I better phrase this idea? And then when you're asleep, it, it kind of sediments and comes together. And then something, I don't know what, catalyzes it at a certain point and it just comes out. So um, I think the reason for this, what you described in the first thing you mentioned, is not that it comes mystically from nowhere. It comes from a, its own history of germination in your uh, thought process, uh, a germination that occurs both awake and asleep. Uh, and for me, that always occurs when my blood, when my heart is beating uh, fast, but steady. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to hear the second thing that you, you had said. Um, if I didn't touch on it, please repeat it. What basically I said was the second process would be actually to still the mind, the stilling of the mind. You know, um, for example, you know, you talked about how we need to get rid of distortions. You know, so uh, the capacity to be able to, uh, you know, rather than think through things, to be able to spill it so that an idea sort of moves into us rather than be following it. Yes. You yes. Know? So that uh, is the second thing. That... <laughs> that's really, yes, that's really perceptive. Of course, that happens. Um, so there is, I think, uh, uh, I, I always think about things dialectically. So uh, like I was talking about subjective and objective and so on, uh, this is a very, what you're describing is very similar. So we have this, um, this flurry of activity, a lot of it uh, rational, a lot of it unconscious, and then um, a catalyst, but uh, 
a step that I left out between the catalyst and the flooding, flooding it onto the paper is that moment of stillness. So you're right, you're very, very right about that. Now that moment of stillness is, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've experienced it and I have never, I've never analyzed it, I've never thought about it. So I'm, I'm going to, I don't think I can say anything interesting about it, but I'm going to think about it. I just want to t tell you one thing. Um, when I write, uh, I, I experiment with different forms of interference. So I'll write with different kinds of music playing, generally non-lyrical music, just music uh, instruments. I don't want to hear words because that interferes with my writing process. Um, and then I'll experiment with what kind of music genre uh, and how loud it is, how this, how this uh, alters my, my writing, both in terms of quantity, how much I write, in terms of uh, quality, uh, how it sounds, how it strikes me, whether it's a final draft or a first draft or, or something like this. So um, there's, in addition to the cognitive aspect and the and that content meditative aspect so we could call it like a there's a contemplative moment and then there's a meditative moment there for me and i think for many other writers as well there is a moment of seeking to be uh, put, put, uh seeking to to be uh um bothered seeking to be uh um, it's very hard to describe. Uh, so there's a concept called refraction, right? In addition to reflection. So you want, you don't want what's in your head just to be, to come out uh, straight onto the paper. You want it to be refracted, altered in some way by music, by sound, by noise. I always turn on the <laughs> AC. I turn off the fan and turn on the AC when I start writing. So there, there are many different factors that, that, that come into play in that creative process right right there. But um, but I'm I'm so glad you asked about that silence. I'm gonna think about that. And uh, if we speak in the future, if I discover anything, I'll 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 let you know. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was quite remarkable. So experiment that with that music, you know, that I will also do. Um, yes. the mood. And the, the, the vastness that it creates, yes. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Man. Our colleague from Mata Sundari College, Dr. Radhika Menon, has a question. Radhika, uh, can I request you to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. That was a very interesting. Thank you, Jyoti. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rathor. It was a very interesting lecture. I had a query with so much of artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, its involvement in writing and the development of uh, bots which are engaged in different kinds of writing. Uh, there, is, there is also a recent report of uh, editorials, the possibility of editorials being written, in fact, a Guardian uh, uh, editorial being written by a bot. Now, the, with what kind of reasonability exists in this kind of scenario, especially considering the, the power of uh, the bot to influence uh, uh, human minds? <laughs> Radhika, the, um, I really love your question, and um, uh, I'm going to remind you of it in about two years, because uh, I'm writing a book right now um, on that uh, topic, uh, on AI and, uh, and uh, uh, reasonability, rationality, and the creative process. So the book is called uh, Tentative, Tentatively why Siri, why Siri will murder us all. Um, and uh, the argument, as you know, Siri is a very weak AI. Um, the argument, uh, okay, I'm going to take just one minute to give you a, a background. I will try to be as quick as possible. When Hannah Arendt published Eichmann in Jerusalem, there was a young uh, scholar at the University of Chicago named Stanley Milgram who read Eichmann in Jerusalem. And Milgram contrived certain experiments um, that became known as the obedience to authority studies where 
um, where a person was put into a room with another person. They were called teacher and learner. And the, uh, the, the so-called teacher was tasked with determining, I'm sorry, was tasked with uh, giving electric shocks to the so-called learner if the learner got the wrong answer. And the cover story behind this was because uh, in that time, in the 1960s, uh, uh, it was very common to have corporal punishment. So if, a, if, if my child did badly at school, I might spank them or slap them or, or whatever. But we all go through this process of, of, uh, of inflicting corporal punishment on our children for committing mistakes, but no scientific study has ever shown whether physical violence against a child um, uh, improves performance. So the cover story behind this experiment was since everyone slaps their kids or spanks their kids or whatever for doing wrong, doing bad at school, it, we assume that that act of physical violence will improve performance. So the teacher, now back to the study, the teacher was tasked with giving an electric shock to a learner when a learner got a wrong answer and they were tabulating whether this would improve the performance of the learner so that we could come up with a scientific answer to whether it's worthwhile to inflict uh, violence on children to make them perform better. Now, that wasn't really what the study was. The study was actually about the teacher and whether a person put into an experimental situation like this would keep giving shocks to the so-called learner until the learner died. That is 450 volts of electric shock. So they started 15 volts and then 30 and then 45 and increased by 15 uh, uh, volts each time a wrong answer is given. And towards the end of the spectrum, uh, these shocks become uh, uh, fatal. And the, the, the teacher knows because there's a skull and bones on the apparatus, the machine, um, the teacher knows that the 450 volt shock is fatal. So the question that Stanley Milgram asked was, in what circumstances would ordinary people come off the streets, engage in this experiment, and kill in the process of that experiment? Because he was testing the banality of evil hypothesis of Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt suggested that anyone, uh, any one of us put in Eichmann's position would have done precisely the same thing. And so Milgram is saying, oh, is that true? So is it that I can get anyone off the street and they will come and kill in this experimental process. Now, Milgram asked uh, psychologists and psychiatrists of the time, I'm doing this experiment, how many people will kill? And the answer that they gave was, well, obviously between one and 3%, because if you take a random sample of society, between one and 3% of us are sociopaths or psychopaths, the kind of person who would do that. And so the, S, the guess was between one and 3%. Now, what do you, to get to the end of it, the conclusion, what was the final result? It was more than two thirds of us. So more, more than two thirds of us, random people who think we are good, would actually kill in the process of this uh, experiment. Now, the reason that I mention it is, in the debriefing, when Milgram says, why did you push 450 volts when you knew it would kill? The answer is, of course, because you told me to, because science demanded it because the experiment demanded it, because I had no choice. You know, all sorts of answers like this. More interesting are the people who refused to kill, that one-third of people. That one-third of people, when asked, why didn't you complete the experiment, they said, because I imagined what it would be like to be the person on the other side. So this element of imagination then comes up again as the solution, it's, called, it's empathic, as a solution to why it is that people don't perpetrate crimes just like Eichmann, why one third of us will refuse to cooperate, will refuse to obey authority, even if it means uh, risking our own imprisonment and death and so on. And the answer is because of this empathic uh, feeling of what it's like to be on the other side. Now, I'm sorry I gave you that long story, but now we come to the conclusion. When you hook up an AI, in this experiment, how many times does it kill? 100%. And why does it kill 100%? Because it has no empathic, it has no imagination. It doesn't matter what it's like to be the person on the other side of that electric shock. The task requires that I complete the experiment. And so the task, even of an artificial intelligence, since AI is built on a cognitive model that assumes that, that 
reasonability is only a weak form of rationality and empathy is an affective, irrelevant component. Artificial intelligence, the intelligence of artificial intelligence is a non-empathic intelligence that when put into such an experiment will kill 100% of the time because the only reason we don't kill, the only reason we're not Eichmanns is because we have imagination and, and empathy built into our cognitive processes. Some of us do. So, uh, so that's a very long answer to your uh, question, but I'm writing a book on this called Why Siri Will Murder Us All, about how AI is taking over ordinary functions, and yet it's constructed, it, the intelligence of AI is constructed upon a cognitive um, paradigm that, that is very classical, very masculine, that assumes that the emotive aspects and so on are just parts of um, the irrelevance of human meat. It's called meat uh, bias. Um, and that uh, um, therefore AI can be more rational than, than human beings. But what it means to be more rational, if we learned anything from Hannah Arendt, is also to be more murderous. And, uh, um, and so, uh, so I feel very strongly about this. So I'm writing this book about how AI in the circumstances that you're describing will eventually, inevitably, uh, lead to, to uh, extremely negative, uh, if not genocidal uh, consequences, as long as the model of rationality <laughs> remains hyper-masculine and totally cognitive without any empathic or imaginative uh, component. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll send you that book. It's, it, it'll be out in, in, in about two years. Um, I'll send you that book, and, and, and I'd love to have your feedback on it. We are, we are left, we're left with barely four minutes. Before I hand over to Dr. Rekha Navneet, our colleague Neema Chaurasya from Department of Education has a question. So Neema, will you please unmute yourself and quickly ask that question? And I also asked Shivangi Verma and um, Himani, Himani Semwal from the Elementary Education Department to unmute themselves and ask their question. And maybe Professor Athor, you could take the three questions together very quickly. We have only three to four minutes before um, Dr. Rekha Navneet wraps up the proceedings for today. Hi, Dr. Okay. Rathor, this is Neema Chaurasya. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, I had a small question. Uh, I haven't read the book, but like you say, Hannah says that Eichmann didn't have the capacity to think in the shoes of the other. Is this capacity to transcend subjectivity innate in some people, in which case the effort of dialogue to arrive at rationality with people like that would be futile? Um, very short, that's a very short and sweet uh, question, and I, I know uh, Dr. Jyoti so politely was hinting at how long I give my answers. <laughs> I have eaten up everybody's time. Um, so I can answer that very quickly instead of uh, together. Um, it is, it, the capacity is innate, but not the actuality. So it's a potentiality. As a potentiality, just like cognition itself, it can be cultivated and exercised, and certainly there are genetic factors which make some people more um, uh, prone to be empathic and some people more prone to be less empathic, certainly genetic, natural factors, but there are also largely social factors that lead to it, and there are a huge number of studies that show, for example, when parents do not uh, read with their children, the children turn out to be less empathic and things like this. So there, there are several studies that show that it can be cultivated also. Good morning, sir. So this is Shivangi Verma, and I would really like to thank you for the session today. Uh, I hope you're able to listen to me Yes, yes, I can hear. Thank you, Shiva. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So today's session was really enlightening, and I have a very humorous question. I hope <laughs> because actually I'm really stuck at it. So, sir, I'm a fourth-year student, uh, post bachelor's 
documentary education and i've been thinking a lot about aesthetic writing and i'm also doing uh, one college project this year on development of curriculum based on children's need to know and to be and how the meaning of schools have been reduced only to fulfill the purpose of teaching and studying where authoritarian knowledge have completely neglected the active role of children in the schools also sir in this project i am trying to examine the prevailing curriculum in the mainstream school where i am doing my internship i i will analyze and explore the curricular spaces in the curriculum presented by the teachers of the school and i am also going to analyze my own lesson plans which i am preparing based on the guidelines given by the school and my main aim to do this project is like to prepare the curriculum which rep which reflects my own vision based on children need to know and to be so sir although i am really clear about the idea of my project but i am facing a lot of difficulty to pen down my ideas and give some direction if you can please guide me how should i start my project and take it forward because i'm really feeling stuck yes um well it's a it's a fascinating topic and uh, of course your 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 diagnosis seems perfectly correct the formalization the the orientation towards examination as opposed to um towards uh, cultivating the idea the innate sort of natural curiosity of of uh, children that needs to be uh to to be fed and nurtured in order to flourish uh, gets stamped out crushed out by the the mass production of of uh, systems of knowledge and pedagogy i i think you're completely right on all of these things um but unfortunately i'm not an expert in the solution by any stretch of the imagination i uh personally uh you know i have read a, a lot from the montessori uh school and um i sent my children to um to 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 non-standard uh schools precisely for this reason that you you mentioned but as an academician i'm i'm afraid i can't tell you uh where to go i am sure you will find uh faculty in your program who 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 are masters of this um of these topics because it's so important um so i'm sorry i i i can't no problem you. sir um, but i i do wish you well because it's such an important topic thank you so much sir sir although i got really good ideas by listening to you i can at least start my project but maybe i can concern with the teachers in my department but sir thank you for the uh, session today thank you so much sir uh hello sir am yes. i audible yes sir this is himani semwal from bled third year and uh, sir the session spoke uh, this session focuses on the importance of writing as an enabling cognitive unit so sir my question is how can we as the youth of the country empower ourselves as well as bring about a change in the society uh, well that's um... that's a very big uh, question if you put it towards uh, writing if we focus it on writing then i i think th there's already um uh, a hint there you know i i read uh, uh youth ki awaaz uh, very frequently that uh, that website um because i keep wanting to know what uh the young people uh w- where their thinking lies you see there are studies that suggest that india's youth if we just stick to india the youngest country in the world where you know so much of the population is is so young and yet the bureaucracy and political uh, elite and so on is so old um you know and i always found it very funny that um that uh, people stop being leaders of the youth um youth parties like youth congress when they're 40 <laughs> there's nothing youthful about a 40 year old so um 
you know, so we have this real discrepancy between how young India is and how little young India has a voice. Uh, so if we stick just to writing, um, I think it's, it, it would be a great um, benefit to everyone, given what writing does in terms of clarifying self-clarification um, and communication and so on. It would be a benefit not only to the youth if they wrote more, published more in newspapers, magazines, created little magazines, whatever was possible. Um, and uh, a benefit to our, you know, older, older generations to hear what the youth have to say, what ideas they have. Now, the Indian education system, going back to what Shivangi was saying, is not only, doesn't only crush um, uh, imagination and so on, it's also highly paternalistic. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, everyone knows that it's patriarchal, but patriarchy and paternalism are different. So it, it's paternalistic in the sense that it's like uh, I, as your teacher, um, best, have the, you know, the, uh, uh, I bestow sort of knowledge on you as, uh, as a privilege. Um, and I control and dominate what you do, what you decide, how you, when you write, how you should appear, how you should speak. You know, there's all of this sort of paternalistic control. And um, uh, so I think the vitality of youth uh, gets uh, crushed out by the paternalism of our system. Um, so what I would suggest to you is uh, just keeping writing in mind, do, creating as many forums for writing and publication as possible um, so that, we, that everyone, including the young themselves, can hear their voice. Um, and only when we start to get a flood of the voice of the youth in the public sphere, will we start to feel the effects of the youth on the public sphere? I don't understand why our politicians, I mean, I'm, I hate to sound like an ageist and so on, I'm an old man myself. I don't understand why our politicians are so old. I mean, we have the oldest, the youngest, youthful, most youthful population and the oldest politicians. There's never been, uh, who was it like a Bill Clinton or a, Tony Blair or something, people who were prime ministers and presidents at 40, 42. Um, we have, you know, our young politicians are 78. So uh, this huge gap has got to be um, filled by the voice of the youth. And the voice of the youth can only, uh, we can only hear it when it's in writing because it has to be uh, uh, publicized. So I suggest as many avenues of, of youth, like uh, little magazines and um, uh, um, uh, uh, this youth kiavaj kind of paradigm, I, I suggest as many of those as possible because it clarifies your own thoughts and it gets those thoughts out into public. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Jyoti, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Come, come here. Yes. Yeah. Put it here. And sit here. This is I can't hear anything. Oh, take this, this one. Quickly. Yeah, I'll just yeah, put it on. Okay, put it. Done. Done. First one. Make a first one. First one. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, there is uh, just one more uh, question in the chat, which I'll just read out. Uh, it's actually uh, almost like what you stated. It is about uh, difficulty of uh, uh, acknowledging good as being uh, a necessary condition for uh, the rational. And this is by uh, Almira. So Almira says that like Hannah didn't have the capacity to think in the shoes of other. No, no. She has that there are some contemporary philosophers like uh, Ellen Gilbert and Ralph Wedgwood who argue that the notion of rationality is normative. That is rationality prescribes us or guides us what we ought to do. Whereas the notion of good also being a normative concept conceptually is different from the notion of rationality. 
So, of course, meta ethical analysis of the term good might be a complex uh, one as most philosophers define it. But don't you think being good does not necessarily imply being rational? So, I guess that you had uh, pointed this out. So, if you want to add something to it, otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Uh, yeah, I, I just thank Almira for the question. And um, yes, of course, uh, there, there's both procedural and substantive aspects to both. So there are procedural aspects to being good. So let's say that the content and the form can be differentiated. And these are the same, this is also true about rationality. You can separate the content and the form. In logic, this is referred to as the distinction between validity and soundness. And, uh, and, and in rationality, you can, you, can, um, you can think about the form of reasoning versus the content of reasoning. And the same thing has to be true in morality. So in some respects, while we equate form and content in morality and we distinguish them in logic, I believe that they should be distinguished in morality as well. And what would the form as opposed to the content consist of, it would consist of procedure. So in, uh, in law, in legal theory, there's a distinction between natural justice or procedural justice versus merits. Uh, so you can argue a case because of the process, or you can argue a case because of the merits. And the same is true that in um, interaction in the social world, uh, there are procedural goods as opposed to substantive uh, and so the alignment of all of the procedures and the substances or the forms and the contents in cognition, in morality, in jurisprudence, each of these things can be lined up in different ways. So it, 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 Plato might have said, you know, the idea of the form of the good is the, is the rational. But if you look at the processes laid out um, in the dialogues themselves, they're all tweaked in different ways, in different, more subtle ways. And I think that's what the philosophers you mentioned are talking about in some respect, rationality as procedure, and I argue morality as procedure as well. Thank you, Almira. Uh, all right, so that was, what do I say? It was right from inception of the ideas to the act of writing, the organic unity between rationality, reasonability, imaginative reconstruct, transcendence of subjectivity, and in a way, try to empathize with the other more on the cognitive sense rather than merely a rational sense. So thank you very much, Professor Akar Singh Rathor, for that inv uh, invigorating lecture. It's always a delight to hear you and to read you. So thank you very much. And from on behalf of all three of us and Gargi College, we extend a very heartfelt thanks to you. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you to all. Much. And thank you to all the attendees. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and just as a final word, I, I haven't seen how to get to the chat in WebEx. I'm new to WebEx. If there are things that I didn't answer, just you can email me or you can log on to my website. There's a contact form. And if you don't know my email, and you can contact me and we'll carry on further there. Thank you all Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.